In our old age, we gotta put on some glasses. There we go. I love this worship song. That is a beautiful a message in that song. And did you you catch that? We we will we will pray and we'll be brave in prayer. I like that. And then it says, We will praise the Lord along our way. And that's what we're going to really do this morning is praise the Lord. I want to enroll you in a school of praise because it is praise that really sustains us and buoys us up in our trials and, and temptations of life. If we can keep our eyes directed on God and get praise to come out of our mouth, it somehow realigns us. It is the orientation. We're going to talk about praise today. Each of you is specially chosen, I believe, to be here in this spot in the world. You have been hand-selected by the Lord, and you felt maybe you came here just because of an opportunity, some financial gain or some job that seemed especially appealing. But I think that at a time where we're in the last days of Earth's history, do you believe that we're in the last days of Earth's history? Certainly we all have to feel that and sense that in our heart. And, and there is a, a peoples that are unreached. And there are nations that are unreached, more unreached than any other place. What would be on God's radar but to reach those people? Wouldn't it be? For this gospel must go into all the world. And must be preached to all people. And so God has priorities. And he's thinking about how could I take a gospel filled woman. And transport her to a place where the gospel isn't being preached. And being isn't being spoken. How could I take this man from uh, Zambia. And move him into the United Arab Emirates. That he could proclaim my praises among his people. How could I take this person from the Philippines who loves to declare my name and move them into Dubai where my name isn't spoken so loudly? And so you each have come here with a purpose to praise the Lord. What do you do? Do you ever get that question? What do you do for a living? I praise the Lord. That's what we can say when people ask you, what do you do? Well, I praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, really, when it all comes down to it, does it matter that you're an engineer? Does it matter that you're, that you're somehow a nurse or a doctor? You know, what do you do? I praise the Lord. Now, that's a good answer. Because, you know, truth be told, that engineering is going to pass away. And doctoring is going to pass away. And all that nursing is going to pass away. But praise, it will continue into eternity. Hallelujah. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 2. You know this text very well. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen people. You know it. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen people. This is what I believe. You have been hand selected to be here to praise the Lord. You have come to the United Arab Emirates by the Lord's hand. Guided, selected, lifted, transported. Now you're here for one purpose. Listen to Verse 9. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That is, you are a Seventh-day Adventist. You've gathered in the fragments of the Scripture. You've allowed the Holy Spirit to empower them in your life. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, belonging to God, that you may what? That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at that, they got that right there on the screen. That you may declare the praises. You may show forth the praises of him 
who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the gospel. Some of you have maybe uh, uh, come out of the world. You've had seasons of your life where you know what darkness is, addictions, habits that were shameful. And God has pulled you out of those things that you may show on your face the glories of the Lord. Amen. So, we understand from this verse that you are to be an agent of praise. You got that? An agent. When you hear that word agent, what do you think? It's somehow a, a go-between. It's a person on a special assignment, right? Last night we checked into a hotel and they gave us a, a room. It was room 007. 007. I thought about that agent, right? You are an agent of praise. You are an ambassador of praise. You are actually coming from a different country. What do you do? I praise the Lord. Where are you from? I'm from a different country. I am from a kingdom far away. You are an angel of praise. What does angel mean anyway? It means messenger. You are a messenger who is praising the Lord. You see, praise is not about who I am. Praise is about who he is. It doesn't, you don't dive into your, your inner being to find out what you have accomplished or what you've done to find that, that source of that praise. It's all about what God is and what he has done. And there's an infinite spectrum of things in which to draw from when you praise the Lord because God has no end to his depth of creativity and wonder about what he has done. Of course, we can draw from uh, what he has done to us and what he is now doing in us and the changes that he's making in our lives. Hallelujah. So, praise has a source. A source. It's from the depths of our, our gratitude. He's drawn us out of darkness and into light, and I'm so thankful for the rescue for the salvation that I've inherited. I, I'm an inheritor of this marvelous plan of salvation and all of the miracles that are invested in it, that he would gather up uh, the angels of the heavens to empower me, that he'd take of his own Holy Spirit and put it inside of me. And Jesus says that the Father and him come to make their abode in us. Hallelujah. And so we praise God out of gratitude. I'm, gra I'm grateful that I do not have to have the condemnation that I deserve. And instead, I get life and peace and hope. Praise is source, is gratitude. It's also awe. That word awe, A-W-E, awe of who God is. That he is, is the maker of all the galaxies and the stars. I mean, all of that but I'm just as much in awe that that maker of all of those things is interested in tiny little me. Isn't it odd that we can talk to God? How many of you have talked to the president of the United States of America or the king of the Arab Emirates? We don't do it, but at our tiniest little gesture, our little voice, good morning, Lord, he's all ears. Isn't it odd that we can talk to God? Oh, D, D, it's odd. And because of that, I am A-W-E-D. I am odd. I am in awe of my God. So we praise from the depths of our gratitude. We praise because of awe. We praise out of love. We love God, and so we let our mouth speak of that love. I've, as a pastor, it's a wonderful thing to be able to perform wedding ceremonies. And, you know, here, here I am as the pastor, and the groom is on this side, and the bride is on this side, and they join hands. And there is a look between those two of love. And, you know, it's, you spend a lot of time preparing wedding messages and trying to create curious little advice for this couple. But you know what I found? They are not listening. 
They are looking at one another. And there is a laser love and a laser look of love going between this couple that you cannot cut because the eyes are in fascination with one another. There is a depth of love. And that's where praise is. We look into God's face. The Bible says we shall see God face to face. Why are we interested in that face? It's all about love. We want to look into his eyes and he will look back at us with love. And for that, I praise him. I praise God from the depths of my fascination about him. I am fascinated about God and I will praise him for that. I'm fascinated with how he works. Doesn't it amaze you how he's interested in you and the things that you need? One time I was in Michigan, I was driving along with my wife and we had just gotten a gift from some friends of a day, uh, cross country skiing. Now that's an unusual sport to talk about in the United Arab Emirates, but there is a, such a thing in the world called snow and it's a wonderful stuff. It's white and sticky and, and wet and when you put these cross country skis off on, you can go off into the forest and it's so quiet and lovely and peaceful. And we'd taken this whole day cross country skiing and it was so fun, my wife and I. And we're driving along talking about how fun this was. And my wife and I said, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have our own cross-country skis? And I said, honey, that's, that's impossible. I said, those things are like $150 each or $200 each. I said, we'll never be able to afford that. And my wife said, but I think the Lord would love it if we could be able to ski sometimes because it's just so worshipful out there in the snow in the forest. And I laughed and I said, honey, let's pray about it. And this was such an unusual experience. We're driving along and we prayed together while we're driving. Lord, would you help us to find some cross-country skis? You know, within about 30 seconds, we passed a sign that said garage sale. And in Michigan, there are garage sales. And so we said, hey, let's go over there. We pulled in, and there's somebody with their garage and all the junk laid out there. And we get out, we walk in, and you know, they had two pairs of cross-country skis for sale. And, you know, the not all skis are made the same. I have big feet. My wife's got little feet. And there was boots. And we tried them on, and the one pair of skis fit my feet and the other pair of boots fit my wife, and we got the whole set for $35. Isn't God fantastic? He is so unusual. How does God do what he does? He's fascinating, and I will praise God because he is fascinating, and he is fascinated with us and interested in the things of our life. We must press forward this year. Saints, in praise, press ahead. When people ask you, what do you do? What do the people of the United, what do the Seventh-day Adventists of the United Arab Emirates do? They praise the Lord. Amen? You see, praise is telling God what you feel about him. Now, I'm from this little state in the United States called Nebraska, and there is a city there called Omaha, and uh, there's one church, a Presbyterian church, that had an experiment about praise. And at the entrance, you know, Presbyterians are a little bit, um, should I say, stiff. You know, they, they don't always want to express their praise to the Lord. And so in this Presbyterian church, the pastor gave out a helium balloon to each person as they walked into the church. And his instructions were, as you will feel somehow moved by the message, moved by the word of God today, I will just invite you that you could just release that helium balloon and it will float up to heaven. And that will be as if you were saying, praise the Lord. And so people are there holding their balloons, waiting for the scriptures to be told and the gospel to be preached. And as the preacher was preaching, one by one, those helium balloons would go up 
and ascend to heaven. But you know, he got to the end of his message and about a third of those balloons are still in people's grasp. They, they had not felt in their heart enough praise to God to let go of that helium balloon. You know, praise is simply telling God how we feel about him. Can you say, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. We got to let it out. We can't just hold this in. I mean, we can praise the Lord in our mind, but how much more worthwhile it is when we let it come out of our mouth and we speak it because it begins to influence other people. And that's the power of praise is it actually has a magnetic influence. This week, uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about influencing other people for Christ. And do you know your praise has a magnetic power to create in other people a certain envy, a holy envy, because they hear this praise and they say to themselves, I wish that I could praise God like that person does. That's a, good, that's a good envy to have, isn't it? And when you praise God and you, you're telling about all the wonders of God, people say, man, that God is good. I, I want to praise him as well. And so praise is telling God what we feel about him. Praise is also telling yourself who God is. It's a reminder. It's this circle that goes up around and around and then it and it's telling others about how God and you relate in Abu Dhabi I've read about a solar power plant biggest solar power plant in the world they have in the center this tower that's about 150 meters high and then around it they have a hundred thousand mirrors and all of those mirrors, have you read about this? Have you seen it? All of those mirrors are pointing towards that tower. And they are all controlled by computers. So as the sun moves, the mirrors move. And they're grabbing in that sun power, reflecting it, and shining with, with such strength, sunshine strength at that tower. And that tower is just glowing because it's so hot. And then they take all of that energy and they actually fuel about 70,000 houses, power, energy, with that, uh, with that uh, solar power. Can you imagine 100,000 mirrors reflecting the sun and shining it at one central point? Now, as I think about that, that's what I think about praise. All of your praise is fo has a focal point. We're getting that power from heaven, from the heavenly sun, and it's coming into us, and we shine that power back at Christ. Amen? In fact, the imagery is so clear when you think about the sanctuary in the wilderness. And out in the desert, there was the Ark of the Covenant and the the sanctuary and around it were all the tents of the Israelites and they would wake up in the morning and all of their their faces were turned towards that Ark of the Covenant and they would praise and sing praises to God and there they are turned towards the sanctuary and above it was the pillar of cloud right what an image an image of praise we praise God for his mercy. We praise him for his grace. We can also praise him for hardship. Do we ever praise God for hardship? Why would I praise him for hardship? Now here's a little story. I don't know if it's a true story or a fictional story, but there was a told that in World War II, there was a general in uh, fighting against the Japanese. And they were in New Guinea, and he had a captain that would go with the general wherever they were. And uh, during the war, there the captain and the general were together. And a bullet came and it shot off the general's thumb. And so the captain said, praise the Lord. 
the general got so mad about this that, uh, that he said, praise the Lord, about his thumb being shot off that the general put the captain in prison. Well, it wasn't but shortly after this that the, uh, the natives there in New Guinea captured that general and they were going to eat him. They, they are headhunters, you know, in New Guinea, cannibals. And so they captured this general and they were going to uh, cook him and then they saw that he was imperfect. He was, he was missing this thumb. And they said, this is so unusual, a man with no thumb. We will not eat an uh, imperfect uh, man. And so they released him. And when the general got out, he came back to the, the uh, camp and he went to that prison and he released his captain. And he said, I am so sorry that I put you in prison when you said, praise the Lord, because my thumb had been shut off, uh, shot off. Do you know it saved my life? And, uh, and the captain said, well, it's okay. He said, I, I praise the Lord that I was in jail. And now the general was taken back. He says, how can you praise the Lord that you were in jail? He said, because if I wasn't in jail, I would have been with you. And look, I have both thumbs. They would have eaten me. <laughs> we can praise the Lord in trouble, can't we? There is always a reason to praise God. We don't understand why cancer comes. We don't understand why car accidents come. We don't understand these things. But you know, it's not our job in praise to figure out the whole script. That's not what God has assigned us, is to try to figure out how this could be turned around to a praise. All we're assigned is Praise the Lord. I'll praise him for the past. I'll praise him for the future. I'll praise him for his benefits. Psalms 103, praise him for all of his benefits. It's such a uh, powerful thing. And in the in book of Revelation, we see the angels praising him. We see them saying, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And so Psalms 150 and verse 6 gives this powerful command to us, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There's water dripping right here. Praise the Lord. That is unusual. I think it is raining inside the building here. Well, you know, there's this little word, hallelujah. Little word. Hallelujah is the most condensed form that you can put, like a, a, an atom. It actually has nuclear power in a tiny atom. And, and hallelujah is the smallest package of praise that we can have. And inside of hallelujah, you know where we get the word hallelujah is the Hebrew, hallel, which means praise, and yah, which is Yahweh. And you know what is between halal and yah? When you say hallelujah, there's the letter U. Praise ye Yahweh. In other words, when you see the letter U in hallelujah, that's ye, that's you, that's me. We're in the middle of the hallelujah. So put yourself in that praise with all your heart. You are in that package that's just about to burst with nuclear power. God asks us to praise him. Turn to Psalm chapter 22. I want you to look there. Psalm chapter 22 and verse 33. I'm sorry, verse 3. Psalm 22 and verse 3. You have it right there on the board. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. What does Israel mean? God is my victory, right? 
God is my victory. So these are the people who have found that God is their victory. That is righteousness by faith. Not our victories, but God's victories. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest. What does inhabitest mean? It means to dwell in. God actually comes and makes home in our praise. Do you get this picture that when you make praises to God, there is the visitation of God and he comes to dwell among us. There's no praise, no visitation. Praise and God says, now this is a place I can live. He inhabits the praises of his people. And so in that sense, we're making a temporary tent for the Holy Spirit's arrival. And it's just like at Pentecost, the people pray 10 days, and there they are praising the Lord. And the Holy Spirit says, this is irresistible. I got to go and live among these people. And so, saints, let us praise the Lord and become an irresistible place of, of dwelling for the Holy Spirit. Now this Psalm 22 is something special. Now I'm going to uh, uh, tell those who are running this, this uh, board here, I'm going to list off a lot of texts, so don't start scrambling and trying to put them up all on the board. You're going to have to look these up in your Bible because you'll go crazy if you start looking up what I'm going to do next. Look at Psalm 22 and verse 1. We just were in Psalms 22 and verse 3, right? You were enthroned as the Holy One. Thou, art, thou inhabits the praise of thy people. That's Psalms 22. Now we're in Psalms 22, verse 1. What is the context of that? The context, listen, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where have you heard those words before? This is the cross. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Can you understand that Jesus was the habitation of the Father? Jesus praised the Father throughout his whole lifetime. And the Father dwelt in him. And now on the cross, Jesus' praise machine is working. He is praising the Lord. But to make the gospel work, the habitation of the Lord, Father is leaving the presence of the Son. And he says, so, my God, where art thou? Verse 2, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night. And am not silent. I want to investigate this with you because what we have here, the Psalms, you know, are the praises of the Bible. The Psalms is the place of praise. And what we're, what we're told here and given a piece of secret information is that Jesus was quoting the Psalms throughout the Calvary experience. So, did Jesus praise in hardship? It seems that through from Gethsemane all the way up to the time when he breathed his last, he went to the Psalms and was praising the Lord. I would say that he was actually quoting the Psalms and had come up to this Psalms 22 in his mind and was declaring it out. Let's go to Psalms one, Psalms 1, and imagine with me this scene. They're, they're coming with torches and spears, and they take hold of Jesus, and Jesus begins quoting these Psalms. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or seat, sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And Jesus being led away from Gethsemane, and there he begins to quote the Psalms that he had memorized. A man of praise, Jesus is. And then he goes to Psalms 2. 
And he says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his Messiah, anointed one. This is about Jesus. And this is the moment that Psalms 2 was written. Why do the nations conspire? And Jesus, to encourage himself, goes to the Psalms praising the Lord. And there we turn to Psalms 3. Now Jesus is standing in the courts of Ananias the priest and they, they begin to rail accusations on him. Verse 1, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O oh Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud and he answers me from his holy hill. Can you imagine our dear Jesus quoting these psalms to encourage himself? Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will go to the psalms in, in hardship. In Psalms chapter 4, he gets to Psalms 4 and his beard is being pulled out and they're spitting on him and he quotes this psalm in his mind. Verse 1, answer me when I call to you, oh my righteous God, give me relief and my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Verse 3, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. Do you think these words would have been encouragement to Jesus? I have to think, yes, yes. And so he continues on this passion path of praise. Passion path of praise. Psalms 5, verses 1 and 2, Jesus is now hurting. He's now bleeding. Now they have beaten him. They've taken rods and struck him. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray in the morning. O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning. Can you see the fire there where Peter has just denied Jesus? The People are warming themselves and Jesus is cold. He's bleeding. In the morning, Lord, I lay my voice to you. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. And chapter 6, he gets to Psalm 6, Jesus. And now the, the, the Savior is, is truly hurting terribly. His back has been lacerated and is bleeding. Pieces of skin, his vision is cloudy. Psalms 6. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, verse 1, or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Jesus is quoting these impassioned prayers and praises. And, and as he is speaking, Jesus gets in his memorized mind to come to Psalms 8. And there a praise bursts forth in Psalms 8. Look at verses 1 and 2. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe of the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the sons of man that you care for him? Oh, how that psalm had to be a bright point for our suffering Jesus. 
to think about his own creative hands, his own power spreading out the galaxies, and there he is praising the Lord. And Jesus is encouraged by praise. In Psalm 9, verse 1, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, Most High. And now the wooden cross is placed on Jesus back and his mind is stabilized by prayer we often wonder how could Jesus go through that Golgotha experience and have the mental stability he needed I tell you brothers and sisters my own mother went through breast cancer and then blood cancer and then died how did she have the mental stability through it all I can testify it was through praise if we're going to Praise the Lord. He, he sends his showers of blessings upon us. It somehow encourages our heart. It tells us not who we are, but who God is. And there is a future and there is a hope. And Jesus praised the Lord through it all. And Psalm 14, he finally arrives at Psalm 14. And Jesus says these words, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Can you imagine Jesus nailed to the cross, his hands hanging there, his feet pierced, and Jesus quoting the Psalms as people are, 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 are railing these accusations. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. And at that moment, the thief next to him says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Hallelujah, there is faith. And Jesus gets to Psalm 15, and it says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live in your holy hill? And the thief is given these words. I tell you, my son, this day you shall be with me in paradise. And so the praise psalms continue. Psalms 20, go there. Psalms 20 and verses 1 through 4. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. This was Jesus on the cross. What is the burnt offering? What does the lamb all represent? It's Jesus on the cross. He's recognizing now that the lamb, the burnt offering, will be accepted by the Father. And finally, in chapter 21, O oh Lord, the king rejoices in your strength. How great is his joy in the victories you give. Jesus connecting with the Father, giving him his whole life. And finally he comes to Psalms 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in the midst of his praise, Jesus utters this verbally, vocally for all to hear. Why have you forsaken me? And people hear this. And Jesus is finally come to the prophetic psalm, Psalms 22, where it talks about uh, them casting lots for his garments. And Jesus goes through, it talks about dogs gathered around him. It talks about his being able to count all of his bones. Verse 17, this is the prophetic psalm about Jesus. He says that from his mother's breast he has served the Lord and there is Mary standing in front of him. And finally, this Psalms 22 concludes with these words in verse 31. It is finished. It has been done. And that was the praise of Jesus that it had been accomplished. What was accomplished? If you read Psalm 22, this is what was done. This is what was finished. Listen to the words. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about him. 
And there Jesus hanging his head, fallen on his chest. He is dead, lifeless. And verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Jesus had accomplished his mission of praise. It is done. Hallelujah. So let us, let us praise the Lord. Let no rock cry out in your place. Jesus on the, on the, uh, the week before the cross, when they had the triumphal entrance, he said, these children, they have to praise. If they were not praising, even the rocks would cry out. Let no rock cry out in your place. Praise the Lord. What do you do, saints? We praise God. We praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.